Hello, everyone. Welcome into the Voice of College Football for a special edition of uh, Notre Dame uh, Fighting Irish Live for our 13th edition of doing this on the Golden Domers. Uh, we thought it would be apropos to talk Notre Dame football for 2021 with a commit coming in. Most likely, we will get the official announcement and the word from Nathan Urbach in just a second for a key commit for 2020. 20, yes, 2022. Want to remind everyone, smash the like button on your way in. Please uh, join us on Patreon. Uh, grab the link in the description section or just go to Patreon, Mark Rogers TV. We've got a lot of great stuff there that I've shared a number of times and will later in the hour. Amazon, please use the link in the description section. It helps us build the channel. Go to college football, voiceofcollegefootball.com and register for free at the top of the screen. All right, let's uh, break down the Irish for 21 and first get uh, the rundown on this uh, 22 commit. We got uh, Nathan Urbach on the line from uh, a Notre Dame has to be named, of course. Nathan, how are we doing today? Hey, Mark, I'm doing all right. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. How's it going? Say again? Couldn't hear you too well. I apologize. No, you're good. I'm doing well. How are you? Doing, doing well. I'm glad to be back on. I know it's been a little bit. Um, I don't know when the last time you did a Notre Dame um, you know, live stream was, but uh, no, I'm excited to get on and talk a little Notre Dame football and recruiting specifically. For sure. And uh, let's pick it up right there with uh, the news of the day, the news of the hour. So Jalen Sneed was going to make his announcement just a few minutes ago. Yeah, it looks like it got postponed a little bit. Um, I think I just saw a tweet that said some family members are on their way in and so I think they sit on about 4.15 my time, so 7.15 your guys' time. Um, so we're probably looking at here in the next couple minutes. So what do we know about Jalen Sneed? Top 100 linebacker uh, down to Notre Dame and Oregon um, from the looks of it, um, but has major offers from you know pretty much any, anywhere in the country. Um, was a guy that Notre Dame wasn't really on, actually, until – um, Marcus Freeman came on from Cincinnati, um, wasn't heavily recruited by Notre Dame. He probably would have received an offer at some point, um, but he's just another kid in, in that long line of, um, you know, guys that Notre Dame has offered since Freeman and, and has made traction with because of it. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's uh, talk about the uh, current uh, class and uh, we'll pick it up uh, as well with uh, 2021 talk. Uh, a lot of the uh, commits already uh, in the book. So, so Sneed would be number 18, 17 hard commits. So ninth, uh, rather, let me back it up. They were ninth in the country, according to the uh, 247 Sports Composite Rankings last year, 2021, number nine in the country. They're set up at number four in the country. Of course, it's extremely early, but still uh, off to a great start. Um, so uh, you got to be happy with the class. Uh, who stands out to you? Yeah, I mean, they actually just lost a commit a few days ago. Um, Darren Agu was a three-star, kind of high upside defensive end out of Georgia, um, actually formerly from, um, I think, England, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he ended up decommitting a few uh, – I think it was yesterday, actually. Um, and before that, they were ranked number two. Um, I think Penn State jumped them, and then someone else must have gotten a commit today because they were – um, number three last time I checked. And I think this Jalen Sneed, if, if he does end up choosing Notre Dame, they'll probably get back up to number two. Um, but no, I mean, a couple kids that really stand out. I mean, the linebacker class, even outside of Sneed, is, is terrific. I mean, you look at their top two guys. You got Junior um, from California and then Joshua Burnham uh, out of Michigan. Uh, beat out some top-notch schools for both of those guys. They also have another uh, linebacker commit out of Michigan and Nolan Ziegler. Um, who they beat Michigan for um, a few months back. Um, so adding Sneed would be a really uh, dynamic uh, foursome, um, all four-star guys, um, and three of those guys being like top 115 um, uh, players. Um, other than that, I mean, they're, they're starting to build a really good uh, core at defensive line as well. That's kind of been a trend over the last few years. Um, Aiden Gabera is a guy that they had that they heavily targeted. Uh, landed him a few months back. Tyson Ford, same thing. Both guys are defensive ends. Um, Tyson Ford might end, might end up moving into the um, – maybe to like a three-tech role uh, down the line. He's a big kid that's going to continue to grow. Um, and then uh, they're, they're in on some other guys uh, to possibly add to that defensive line class as well. 
Folks uh, in the live chat, we appreciate you standing by, waiting for us to come on here. And uh, we're going to talk Notre Dame football, and then a little bit later, we will open it up uh, to the nation. Uh, as it stands right now, certainly leave your comments, your questions, your debate topics in the live chat. I'll pass them on to Nathan, and I'll address anything that hits me, of course. Um, it just seems as though after two playoff appearances, Nathan, in the last three years, as though, at least from a national perspective, there's a thought process that this Notre Dame team is going to be good. They're going to be top 10 to 12 good, but there's kind of a give up on the making a real push that's similar to what we've seen two of the last three years, or even the 11 win team that, uh, lost a couple games two years ago that um, this is kind of cycling. I don't want to say down, but not necessarily the roster that can make the push toward the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, overall, it's a pretty young roster. Um, four new, uh, four new guys along the offensive line are going to be starting. Um, so, I mean, that's obviously a huge deal. Um, new quarterback. I mean, I know it's Jack Cohen coming from Wisconsin. Um, you know, so he's a veteran, a veteran guy, but when you lose your, you know, your three year starter, um, you know, there's always going to be question marks. Uh, wide receivers are kind of a big question mark as well. They lost a lot of guys over the last couple of years. Um, have had some some tough luck with injuries at that position and guys transferring out as well. Um, so pretty much every guy outside of Avery Davis uh, that they're going to be counting on this year uh, at, at those skill positions um, are, uh, you know, are guys that haven't had a whole lot of time, um, you know, at the at the major college football level. So, um the defense should be pretty much just as good as the last few years. I mean, you, you didn't really miss a beat with the, with Clark Lee going to Vanderbilt and, and getting Marcus Freeman. Um, and they return a lot of guys on the defensive side of the ball. Um, so I, I think the defense will, will hold down the fort just kind of, just like it kind of has been over the last several seasons. And then maybe we get a surprise um, out of the offense and, and some of these guys that, you know, were previous top recruits um, can show out at receiver. Um, Landon K. Madden, I think, uh, was a he was a two lane transfer, um, and uh, he, uh, he he transferred in uh, to to kind of solidify the offensive line. So that was a big pickup by Notre Dame as well. Appreciate everybody being on the line. We're talking Notre Dame football. We got Nathan Erbach on the line. Uh, we will be here for the next. Um, I don't know how long we'll go. We'll see. Uh, Nathan's awaiting as uh, the rest of you Notre Dame fans are for the confirmation on Jalen Steed, who's going to announce in the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, his decision, most likely to the Fighting Irish, uh, currently the fourth rated class in the nation in the 247 sports composite uh, for 2022, coming off a top 10 finish both on the field and in recruiting in 2021 2020. All right, uh, Nathan, let's stay with the defense since you brought up the defense. Uh, based on what we saw in the spring and also based on what has been stated by Marcus Freeman in particular and players, do we expect him to shake things up or basically take over what Lee was doing and figure the scheme was working with the personnel, let's stay with it, or is Marcus Freeman most likely going to try to shake things up? Uh, real quick before I mention that, I called Absolutely. Matt in a, a two-lane transfer on actually He's from Marshall. Um, yes, so yes, yes. That was my fault on that end. Um, but, yeah. I, no, I should have caught you on that. I was just <laughs> – uh, I was on cruise control as well because, yeah, I was just surprised. I got to tell you, once he became a big deal in the news in the transfer portal, actually my first thought was this guy must legitimately be extremely good – for a Marshall offensive lineman, so they can't gain any stats, their offensive lineman, for him to gain that kind of respect and credibility to be right. a second-team All-American from Marshall, he must be really good. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think uh, – and then yet he was a preseason guy uh, this year as well after not – you know, after winning – or what was he? If you said first-team All-American last year, I believe. I believe second-team. Second-team, and I think this year he was at least in some – um, some publications was a preseason first team all American. So, um, yeah, no, I'm a bit, like I said, big ad for the offensive line after losing a, a lot of guys there, but, uh, no, to your point on Freeman, um, I, I mean, I don't think he's going to try to change too much early on. Um, I mean, Notre Dame has recruited, uh, for Clark Lee's defense over the last, you know, three, four years. And, um, so they have a lot of those guys that are still kind of fit those roles. 
Um, I mean, he's going to tweak some things here and there. I mean, I believe at Cincinnati, um, he was a little bit more defensive back heavy. I think he had five defensive backs at pretty much all times, kind of ran more of a three, uh, three down line, um, you know, for, for the most part. So I, maybe we could transition into that. And you're kind of seeing that a little bit with uh, Notre Dame's um, defensive line a little bit. I think uh, MTA, uh, Myron Tagalova Mosa, um, he's going to play a little of the strong side defensive end this year when he's been a three tech de- technique for Notre Dame um, throughout his career. So um, he's sort of tweaking that already. Um, but for the most part, I mean, you're, you're pretty much going to see the same sort of um, defensive scheme. Um, he, but I do think he's going to be a little bit more aggressive and blitz heavy for sure. And for as good as Kyle Hamilton is, he was pretty much nicked up last year, right? He wasn't actually playing at 100%. Yeah, no, I mean, he's kind of, I think he dealt with some injuries during his freshman year too, but that just kind of goes to show you what type of player he is. Um, you know, he's, I mean, I've already seen him in mock drafts going in maybe the top five, the top 10, which is, you know, you don't really see that too often, um, you know, out of safeties. But no, I mean, he he's, you, you pretty much put anybody around him in the Notre Dame secondary is going to be pretty good, or at least the uh, the safety spot. But uh, um, by the way, Sneed did, did just commit to Notre Dame, so that's actually official um as of about a minute ago there it is Jalen Sneed linebacker to uh linebacker yep linebacker top 50 guy on rivals top 100 guy um top 100 guy on 24 7 sports uh beat out Oregon I think was the uh was the final two um but like I said major offers from pretty much or offers from pretty much every major program we got Nathan Erbach to answer your Notre Dame uh, comments and questions. Uh, Nathan, uh, we're going to put you to work here if we get some comments and questions to address. I'll uh, I'll do the heavy lifting here. Ballard is asking, will Notre Dame be in a conference this year? No, Ballard. That was a one-year deal with uh, ACC. So I'll handle the difficult questions, Nathan, and then uh, you can take down the easy Sense ones. a little sarcasm in that question, though. <laughs> Uh, I, I believe so. Ball, Ballard knows his college football. I think he's just uh, poking the bear a little bit, um, <laughs> wanting to, uh, yeah, make a point. So I also see that Sean Crawford, based on my uh, preseason prep, uh, that he really emerged last year and could be a top corner. Well, Sean Crawford actually was a six-year guy last year. Um, oh. And he, he went undrafted, but he signed with, I believe, the Raiders. Oh, maybe I'm mixing him up with somebody. Who's going to be playing corner? Uh, you have Cam Hart, who's uh, like a, a, a kid that's you know they they had they landed a few years ago. Um, you know he's a guy that they that they really like. Um, they they have a kid um, in Terry Bracy, um, who who's kind of been hit or miss over the last couple of years. Uh, possibly can move into the slot position for him. Um, the the big name to remember there is Clarence Lewis. Was a true freshman last year. Played really well. Um, he'll, I don't know if he'll play field or if he'll play, uh, the boundary spot. He, I think he has the size, um, tackling ability, speed, whatever you want to, to kind of play both, both areas of that field, um, or both, both areas of the field. But, uh, but no, I mean, those are kind of the three guys to, to really, uh, keep track of, um, have some good freshmen coming in, uh, Philip Riley, uh, Ryan Barnes, uh, Jojo Johnson out of, uh, out of the state of Indiana are a few guys to kind of keep an eye on as well that can maybe get early playing time at those positions. So we've got a question coming in here from Stylite uh, concerning uh, Bofa. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Just ignore, just ignore him. Just, just ignore Style. Oh, really? Okay. Thanks for the heads up there. All right. Got, got a little friendly trolling there, so I'll bypass that one. All right. I was when you tweet out that you're going to be on a live show, right? Yeah, you got to watch out for your so-called friends <laughs> uh, jumping in there, too, because I got to tell you, uh, yeah, I went to Bofa 23. 2023 i went to 247 yeah i was all over the place and <laughs> yeah he had me running around for that one too all right all right all right anything else number one nd fan when are we getting the avery davis double pass once the double pass maybe that well, comes was, up against uh, duke was- i don't know <laughs> He was actually originally a Notre Dame uh, quarterback uh, commit, 
uh, out of out of Texas and was actually really really good um, at the high school level. Uh, ended up transitioning to a bunch of different spots. Played a little running back. Played a little corner. Um, and 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 settled in as a as a really good slot receiver last year for Notre Dame, taking over for Chris Fink, um, who left the year prior. So, um, I think Notre Dame fans have been waiting that waiting for that for a while, and uh, I, I think it'd be pretty fun if uh, if they had a few trick plays up their sleeve with Avery Davis. Yeah, so uh, he's part of this uh, wide receiver core that um, who knows? I don't know. Jack Cohn, from a passing standpoint, seems to be not a uh, a great separation from Ian book. I don't think he's quite as mobile and will make the plays that Ian book did with his legs. But, uh, I know Notre Dame fans. I know yourself. I know, uh, just in general, based on the recruiting that, uh, they're looking to open up this offense to some degree and show off some of these guys on the outside. Yeah. I mean, they have, like I said earlier, they, I mean, they've had a little tough luck on the recruiting end of things from uh, guys transferring out guys getting injured. Um, so they, they've had some decent classes uh, and that's for sure. We need to look at it from a, you know, a number standpoint and, and, and ranking standpoint and stuff like that. Um, you know, they've landed some pretty solid players, maybe not to the extent that they should have. Um, but uh, Jordan Johnson, who was a five-star on rivals just transferred to, to UCF during the off season. Um, you know, Kevin Austin, who's been seem, who has seemingly been in Notre Dame forever now, hasn't really had an opportunity due to injuries and some off field stuff early on in his career. So, um, uh oh, we lost Nathan. Nathan, uh, in the midst of breaking down Notre Dame uh, football for us, hopefully, Nathan can make it back. Um, I've got a little bit different setup now with the camera and so forth. So, if I'm looking off screen, it's not that I'm ignoring. Uh, the guest or ignoring you. I used to have all that set right in front of me. And so I could answer the questions and go through the live chat right in front of me. And also, of course, just look right at the guest who was on camera right in front of me. Now it's all over here on the monitor. So not, uh, not zoning out or, uh, you know, uh, not paying attention to my own show, just uh, to, to let you know on that. All right. We got Nathan back. We were going over <laughs> these wide receivers making plays. Sorry about that, Mark. You're good. Um, yeah, no, I mean, like I said, Kevin Austin uh, is a guy that's still on the roster. He's going to be a senior this year, um, coming off of another injury-filled season. So hopefully he's a guy that um, can step up. He certainly has the, the ability to do it. I mean, he was a top 100 guy coming out and had offers from, from pretty much everyone. Um, another, a kid I really like is Xavier Watts, who's also, uh, who was in the class with Jordan Johnson. Um, he was an underrated kid out of Nebraska. Um, a lot of people thought he could actually transition into a corner. Um, that, that's how talented he was on both sides of the ball. But now he's um, and then he had some, some there. Um, hey, Nathan, I think we're losing your audio. Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah, we got you better now. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah, no, Xavier Watts is a guy that I, that I would look at as a young guy that can contribute. Um, but, but in reality, I mean, their, their passing attack is going to be through Michael Mayer. Um, the five-star tight end was a true freshman last year and, and took the country by storm. Um, you know, probably going to be a top 15, top 20 pick in the draft when he's, when he's draft eligible. So, uh, he's, he's definitely the guy to look out for, uh, in the passing game. Uh, but they definitely need to get some deep threats. I mean, Brayden Lindsay actually is another kid, um, a few years back, um, kind of, you know, made his mark at Notre Dame, uh, in a, in a limited role, but, you know, had, you know, they did some some reverses with them. They, they you know, they would just kind of chuck it up and see if he can go catch it. Um, he, he has elite speed, and he's a guy that could can really take the top off the of defense and, and someone that they really need to stay healthy as well. Going back to Mayor, is he just uh, pretty much in the typical mold of your great Notre Dame tight ends, or is there anything different about him? You know, it's weird. I mean. Notre Dame has obviously had a lot of tight ends that have been sort of, sort of more of the, the blocking style, at least at the NFL level, um, or maybe at least not. You know, you, you get these Kyle Pitt, Pitts types these, these days that are more, you know, wide receivers and tight end bodies. Um, Mayor is sort of a combo if you're going to go from a Notre Dame perspective. I've always kind of considered him kind of a combo of Kyle Rudolph and Tyler Eifert. So you're going to get the receiving ability and athletic ability of a Tyler Eifert, but then you're going to get the blocking prowess um, and, and, and big body 
like just nature uh, of a Kyle Rudolph. So, I mean, he, he really is kind of just a freak athlete in that sense. We appreciate everybody being here for Notre Dame football talk. We got Nathan Urbach on the line. Leave your comments, your questions in the live chat. And of course, hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't yet. And uh, we've got some uh, really good news to tell you in the next several weeks when we get things completely ironed out concerning Notre Dame football coverage this fall. All right. Um, looking at the schedule, Hummus Hero brought up the Cincinnati game, which um, typically wouldn't be a big deal. Uh, nobody would blink. Nobody would really be uh, that fascinated with Cincinnati, Notre Dame and non-conference play. But considering this is the standard right now over the last two or three years in the group of five, uh, and really it's Cincinnati's opportunity to do something special this season, kind of wanting, of course, to win the game and then have Notre Dame turn in a Notre Dame type season, 10 and two, uh, the Marcus Freeman, Connection, of course, uh, moving from D.C. to D.C. Uh, between the two teams. Uh, when you look at the entire schedule, we'll start with the Cincinnati game. Is there anything about it that stands out to you in particular? You know, I said for a long time that on paper, this was definitely one of the weaker Notre Dame schedules. Um, but when you really look into it, I think it's it's going to be pretty, pretty par for the course. I um, mean, North Carolina is going to be a talented uh, roster again this year. I, mean, I think USC is kind of on the way back up. Wisconsin's always a really talented program. Um, like you mentioned, Cincinnati's not usually a team that you worry about on your schedule when you're Notre Dame per se. Um, but, you know, they pretty much brought everybody back of notice. I mean, they have Ritter coming back, who is a, a big time uh, quarterback and could be a first round pick um, next year. So, um, I mean, overall, I mean, I think the, the, the schedule itself sh on a, in a normal Notre Dame year, I mean, they should be able to go at least, at least 10 and two, um, 11 and one, possibly 12 and zero if they have, you know, if they have the goods that year. And, um, but I do think that this is somewhat of a transition year for, for Notre Dame to an extent. And, um, you know, but I, I do think the standard is set for them to 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 pretty much be ten and two or better uh, for the most part every season. Are you happy with the scheduling approach? Do you think they should do anything differently? I think um, this is kind of something I've talked to you about in the past. I'm not a huge fan of the ACC setup for them. Uh, I was always really big on the traditional rivals. I miss playing Purdue and Michigan State every year for one. Um, and, and the fact that they're not in a conference joining possibly the weakest of the power five conferences to play five games every year, if, if they don't play Clemson, then it, then it's going to look a little bit shaky at times. Um, but then you go look at it and next year they play Ohio state and Clemson in the same year. And the year after that, they play Ohio state and Clemson in the same year. And then you're like, okay, so maybe this year is just a little bit of a break for them. And, you know, you can't. You can't be the can't have the, the hardest schedule in the world every year. I guess sometimes it's just uh, okay to get a little lucky. <laughs> George is pulling no punches here in regards to man. This is a difficult question if you really want to take it seriously. <laughs> Who's the greatest Notre Dame football player of all time? <laughs> man, it's probably before my time frame. Um, I mean, we're probably looking at, you know, someone like Tim Brown. Uh, he's certainly up there. Um, if we're looking at kind of more recent memory, I mean, obviously Jalen Smith, Manti Teo were, were incredible college football players. Jerome Bettis, um, you know, back in, the, back in like the 90s as well. Um, I, you know, you, when you think of maybe historical standpoint and NFL standpoint, obviously Joe Man Montana, but I wouldn't necessarily say he was the best Notre Dame player of all time. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, Mark, that, that's, that is a tough question. I mean, they've had how many Heisman, how many Heisman winners. So, um, when a, a guy like me, who's, who just turned 28, um, you know, more recent memory is something I'm going to look into, but yeah, no, I mean, it's, you, you, you asked my dad about this a couple years ago. He'd, he'd probably slap me in the face for not mentioning some of the guys I haven't mentioned. So, yeah. Well, uh, shoot, forget the sport. It doesn't really matter. It's just difficult to compare eras. And for a program that won most of its national championships in the, what, 30s to 50s, 
something in that range. And of course they picked up some more in the sixties and seventies, not discounting that at all, but, um, you know, it's just, you know, football, the, the, the game has evolved so much and the athletes have evolved so much, but, uh, you know, if you were talking coaching, then the, the records from era Parsegan and Frank Leahy and those guys are just so overwhelming the winning percentage and the number of championships that, uh, uh, even though again, different game to a certain extent, uh, that's, that's, um, you know, if you get these legendary n- names from every era, but you can't go from an athletic standpoint or a statistical standpoint and really back it up. But, uh, in terms of just winning football games, uh, that's when they racked up the best winning percentage and, uh, obviously took a huge lead in, uh, near the most wins in history where, where is this there? There is, they're still in the top five. I forget the pecking order exactly. Yeah, no, I mean, I think they're top, if I'm not mistaken, I think they're top three or four in both yeah. winning percentage and, and all time wins. So. Yes. Our friends at Michigan, um, should be warned that I believe Ohio state overtook them in all time winning percentage this past football season. I remember seeing that at some point during the the year that if Ohio State won the rest of its games and they did, well, they did lose to Alabama. But anyway, basically, Ohio State, from a winning percentage standpoint, for almost ever, uh, Michigan had that lead. And uh, Ohio State caught them, apparently. And again, the, the wins totals are so close up near the top and just about everybody's tracking down Michigan at this point. And I know you don't are not bothered by that. <laughs> I'm probably the most tame Notre Dame fan there is when it comes to hating Michigan. I could care less. Yeah. It's more about uh, USC, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm, for you. I'm, yeah, for me being a Vegas kid, um, you know, growing up, I went to USC games every year against Notre Dame. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's Michigan just didn't bother me as much as I think people in, out, in, out in Indiana in the Midwest, I should say in general, at least according to Wikipedia, Michigan, 964, Ohio state, 931, Alabama, 929, Texas, 923, Notre Dame, 918. That's the top five in wins winning. I, pers- that, I don't think that includes the, uh, or I think that does include, the 2012 year where they took all of Brian Kelly's games. Yeah. They took Notre Dame's wins away that year. Alabama lost a ton of games in 93. They went from what their record was that year. It wasn't great, but it was like nine and three to zero and 12. And Jim Trestle got his 11 and one 12 and one season wiped out in 2010. So I, I don't even see any use in doing that. They should just leave all that alone. That's not penalizing anybody in particular. But, uh, yeah, winning percentage, Ohio State. uh, Man, we've got a log jam. Ohio State at 730, Alabama 729, Notre Dame 729, Michigan 727. So they've dropped a fourth in Oklahoma 726. There you go. All right. Is there anything uh, with... Let's see, August camp. We are just about two to three weeks away. Yeah, no, I mean it's exciting times, and we're. I think I just had a fantasy football draft a few a few a few weeks back. It was a dynasty draft for anybody wondering why it's this early, but uh, yeah, no, you start doing stuff like that, and you you <laughs> you start thinking football's coming back. Um, but no, I mean, I mean, I guess we can kind of maybe talk about some interesting battles that could be. Uh, you know, there for Notre Dame. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily put it past Notre Dame to to at least push Cohen for the for the quarterback position. Um, you know, Tyler Buckner was a top notch recruit. Don't see him winning that battle. I mean, I don't think you bring in a guy like Cohen if he's not going to win the battle overall. Um, but uh, you know, Buckner and then I know Drew Pine is a guy the staff really likes. Um, you know, both those guys should have ample opportunity that they perform at a high level. They they have every like I said every opportunity to maybe win that battle down the road even if it's not necessarily week one um i should say i I have a hard time believing jack cohen's not going to be the starter week one but i could 
see a scenario where, um, you know, maybe the team's like four and two after the first six weeks and they're saying, hey, like we're not going to make the college football playoff this year. Let's get the young guys rolling. Um, something like that, especially if they're showing out in camp, um, you know, and in, in early on during the season uh, and practices and so on and so forth. You've probably never seen this comment uh, before. I see that every day, Mark. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I am sure you do. Okay. You warned me, but he says it's a real question here from Stylight. How much of an impact do you think Marcus Freeman leaving after one year would have on Vernon's commitment? Yeah, so Brennan Vernon is a 2023 commit for Notre Dame, five-star kid that they landed out of uh, Ohio. Um, had an Ohio State offer, so obviously was a big-time recruit for them as well. Not something that Notre Dame wins too often. Um, no, I mean, obviously, I think if you lose your, your defensive coordinator – um, especially after it only being one season, you're, you're probably going to have a few guys commit or at least reevaluate their situation. Um, luckily, I don't think Freeman's going to leave after year one just based off some of the things I've been hearing. Um, I, I think at minimum he'll be here two years. But, um, but no, I mean, obviously, I don't think they were going to land Vernon unless they had Freeman. Um, and I think that's pretty cut and dry. So, Freeman leaves, then you're going to have to do some work on that end to keep him from Ohio State, would be my guess. I don't recognize any of these 23 guys. Uh, I, I am doing my best just to keep up with the 22 class and with, you know, 50 different teams. But uh, so, yeah, five-star, top 20 player, regardless of position, second-rated player in the state of Ohio. And just to give you an idea, I think he is, as of right now, the highest-ranked player committed to a school. Not that that means much overall, um, but uh, but yeah, Notre Dame's already doing a pretty good job in the 2023 class as well. And they've always been, it's weird, they've always been at school, even before, prior to the, um, the early signing period that started a few years back, they've always been a program that lands their kids early. And I think a lot of that has to do with like the academic nature of, of the, you know, the program. They kind of know who they can, who they can go after, who they can't. Um, and, and they probably, their, their list is very narrow, um, compared to, you know, some other programs, um, even very early on, um, you, you kind of see it with Stanford as well. Stanford maybe has a little bit more rigorous, you know, academic standards to get into. So sometimes their class takes shapes a little, takes shape a little bit later because the guys aren't necessarily admitted. Um, and, and they like to have guys admitted before they kind of, before they commit, but, um, you know, I'm looking at even Notre Dame's board now, and obviously they have 18 guys, so it's it's a little bit you know easier to say this, but they have maybe six or seven legitimate targets uh, at the moment. You know, maybe upwards to 10, which you know probably most programs still have 30, 40, 50 guys that they're they're kind of talking to on a normal basis. And we are talking Notre Dame football here with Nathan Erbach, who joins us on a regular basis to break down the Irish for us. And, of course, Notre Dame coming off uh, two playoff seasons in the past three years, an 11-win campaign, of course, two years ago in 2019. Maybe they downcycle a little bit this year, but certainly everybody's beatable on the schedule, although they could come up with three or four losses. I think 10-2 and two is uh, certainly within that uh, range. And uh, Jack Cohn, a quarterback who uh, led Wisconsin to a Rose Bowl game against uh, Oregon a couple of years ago, most likely the starter out of the gate. Uh, Golden Blue Dude uh, mm -hmm. is chalking up four losses here. One, two, three, four. Wisconsin, USC, North Carolina, Cincinnati. That would pretty much be they lose every, everybody, <laughs> lose to everybody on their schedule that they could, that you could maybe say is a game they could lose. <laughs> That would be that. That's kind of just me looking at the schedule like that. I, those, I think, those are their four toughest opponents. I would be very surprised if they lost all four of them. Paul Horning, nineteen fifty six Heisman Trophy winner, of course. Uh, Rudy, I of did course. See a question. Um, I think it was from Darren Ravellis um, regarding the a possible. Notre Dame commit here soon or like who would be the next guy? Yes. Um, I wanted to get to that. Exactly. Go to a it. Guy, 
a guy I would definitely look at if, I, if I, for Notre Dame fans is a cornerback out of um, the out of Arizona, Benjamin Morrison. Um, doesn't necessarily have a date set, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's announcing somewhat soon, uh, possibly within the next week or so. Um, he's down to Notre Dame and Washington, and uh, I would probably put my money on Notre Dame right now for him as well. Uh, four star kid. We've got Felipe Garcia with a comment here, and Felipe just must be a happy guy because regardless of who wins, I think he's just happy. Uh, this is a kind of a strange smorgasbord of um, college football favorite team. Florida State fan, but Ohio State second, then Notre Dame, then Boise State, throw in LSU, and many more. Hey, some people are just fans of football, right? There it is. Yeah. Do you follow the Notre Dame players in the NFL? I do. I do. And uh, definitely the Irish took a knock for quite a long time, probably post Lou Holtz, which seems to be the knock that they're taking across the board until Brian Kelly for, for good reason. Uh, but even with the NFL uh, performance out of Notre Dame between the Lou Holtz teams and what we've seen over the last few years. But uh, I think we've already seen an uptick. The uptick in recruiting has already cycled through to the NFL, and we've seen uh, Notre Dame players make more of an impact here in the last few years. Yeah, I mean, I think the knock on Notre Dame for at least a few years was the lack of uh, skill position players. Obviously, the quarterback position, they still haven't really had a prominent quarterback um, in the NFL for a while, even though they've had some, you know, first and second round picks with, you know, Brady Quinn, Jimmy Clausen, and Deshaun Kaiser, guys like that. Um, but, uh, you know, the knock for a while was, you know, they, they produce an offensive line, they produce tight ends, but what else do they produce? And, you know, I think that, you know, kind of like what you said, at least since the Brian Kelly era, um, you know, that's, that's changed. I mean, you had Jalen Smith, um, at linebacker, for example, Jeremiah Wusukormo this past year at linebacker as well. Drew Tranquil has been a really good linebacker in the NFL uh, his first couple of years. I know he tore his ACL last year, but his rookie season, he was doing really well. Um, you know, Manti Teo didn't necessarily live up to the hype, but he was a five-star kid that committed to Notre Dame and was a second-round pick. Probably would have been a first-round pick if not for the kind of the off-the-field stuff that we don't need to really get into um, today. But um, so those are some linebackers, uh, of course, that have, you know, kind of made their mark. I mean, even even at wide receiver, I mean, Michael Floyd was a first round pick, didn't necessarily live up to his billing. Golden Tate was a really good, you know, was a really good NFL wide receiver for a few years. Um, you know, Will, Will Fuller, um, you know, dynamic speed guy who's, who's been good when he's been healthy. Um, but they're but I'll even say their bread and butter is still on the offensive line and tight end. I mean, you look at. I tell people this all the time. If you took the, the um, if you were to put together a left tackle, like from, from left to right um, on the offensive line in the NFL, Notre Dame would probably have the, if you, if you put them all on the same team, it'd be the best offensive line in the NFL. You'd have Ronnie Stanley at left tackle. You'd have Quentin Nelson at left guard. You'd have Nick Martin at center. Zach Martin at right guard and Mike McGlinchey at right tackle. And then there's a slew of other guys that you can throw in there that are still playing uh, as well. But I don't see how anybody else can make a line that's better than that. Yeah, it is stout. There's no doubt about that. And uh, yeah, they've transitioned to the NFL really well. Cheryl, we appreciate you letting everyone know to subscribe, to hit the bell for the notifications, like the video, do all those things. So Cheryl, thank you so much. You know that. That we appreciate it and appreciate you being here uh, most of the time. So, yeah, we got our main channel right here and we got 22 team channels. Uh, so, if you love college football, most likely we've got you covered on the team channels as well. So, most of the national topics, I, I understand we're doing a Notre Dame live show right here, but uh, generally we hit uh, the big topics and um, the national analytics and all of that right here. And you can go to your specific team channel and um, check out the more granular stuff uh, concerning commitments and all of that. Uh, so please uh, check us out there. And I see that Felipe just uh, found us last night for the first time. So it's good to see you, Felipe. Welcome to the Voice of College Football. And uh, he's, he's the guy you want. He likes everybody. He likes everybody. So Felipe, <laughs> you can go subscribe to every channel. 
We got 22 team channels. Just put in <laughs> Voice of College Football and just follow your way on through, including Notre Dame. We don't have a Boise State channel, though, Felipe, but uh, maybe we'll get there someday. So we will do our best. Uh, and no UCF either, Felipe, but uh, you can check out the other channels. Absolutely. All right, uh, Notre Dame, Notre Dame. I'm I'm certainly um, read up and got my fill from Nathan here on uh, Notre Dame football, so I am good to go, Nathan. Anything else you think we need to hit on? No, I mean, I think that's it. Like I said, I mean, just ramped up recruiting efforts over the last, you know, even year, I think with Marcus Freeman, even though they were in a good place. So, um, you know, Notre Dame has a lot to be excited about on that end. Um, and I think – not just on the defensive side of the ball, but you're going to start seeing some offensive guys here probably within the next month or two as well. At what point are you going to do a little scouting and reading up on Florida state? <laughs> uh, oh, you mean like because of they, cause they play week one. Yeah, they play week one. Sure. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I'll probably, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely have to, um, no, I, <laughs> I don't know, Mark. That's a good, it's a good question. Probably within the next couple months. Probably within the next month or so. So I'm taking from that that you're not taking uh, the Seminoles very seriously here. Uh not as seriously as I probably should. <laughs> this uh, Florida State crowd, they are they are ready to go. They think that uh, they're going to make a major move here and start it off with a big upset on opening night. And that's in Tallahassee, right? It is. Yeah. So I mean, okay. that's obviously, you know, you. You can always you can always lose on the road. I mean, I don't care who you are, uh, especially a team like Florida State. They still recruit at a high level. New coach. Um, yeah, you know, I'm sure that their fans are pretty excited. And yeah, you know, I'm not I'm not downplaying them at all. I mean, that team can get back to national prominence at any point in time. Good stuff, uh, Nathan Urbach. I'm going to bring up his banner here because you can basically just follow him at, at Nathan underscore Urbach. And uh, you can catch all of his uh, comments concerning, uh, of course, Notre Dame, but also all sorts of sports. Absolutely. Nathan, we appreciate you stopping by to talk up the Irish. Thanks for having me, Mark. We'll catch you soon. All right. We threw together our Notre Dame hour with uh, Nathan. We appreciate him coming on board. And uh, I'm going to survey the live chat to see what you've got. We got a lot of great things in store. Okay. Just cut a Michigan video today, posted all of that. We were all over the place with uh, a recent commit just yesterday. Uh, actually, that commit came in after the video. So that commit came in uh, Micah Pollard, uh, Jacksonville linebacker at Michigan. Then we had an NIL discussion, and uh, Phil Steele is ranking Michigan. Did you catch this? Michigan is ranked by Phil Steele at number anybody take a guess Michigan Michigan Phil Steele 60 got him at 60 so the good thing about that is that uh, I'm going to have Phil Steele on here on a Thursday to get his thoughts on that What was perplexing, and I talked to Clayton Safey, our Michigan guy from Rivals, about that today, is that Phil Steele is predicting Michigan to finish 7-5 and five, but be number 60 in the country. So to me, unless I understand the explanation, those to two don't jive. So it's one thing to pick Michigan to go to finish 60th in the country, but for a Big Ten team with their schedule... That team that's 60th in the country is more in the five and to seven, uh, five and seven, six, not even six and six range. Because think of it this way go to the final regular season top 25 any year, the regular season top 25 at the end of the season before the bowl games. Look at the top 25. What are you going to find? You're going to find a ton of power five teams with eight and four records that are ranked between 15 and 25. And then there might be some top 25 te or there might be some eight and four teams that didn't quite make the top 25. Okay. So what am I pushing at there? 
that the eight and four teams in the power five, especially at a place like Michigan that play a big 10 schedule are in that 15 to 25 range. And so seven and five, that seven and five group is usually 35, 40. So it's not making sense to me, 60 and seven and five, number 60 in the country, seven wins, five losses. So we'll ask Phil Steele about that. He does an amazing job. His publication is unlike anybody else. Uh, Athlons is good. Lindy's is good. Street and Smith, whoever else is out there these days. But uh, Phil Steele packs in more information into that publication than anyone. And we'll talk to Phil Steele on Thursday. Tuesday night, 8 Eastern, Nebraska Live on the Nebraska Channel. All right. The math doesn't add up, Golden Blue Dude. It does not add up for some reason. And again, he might have some kind of explanation. I don't know what that would be to give us some perspective on that. I am not Nathan Erbach, so I'm going to change the banner here. And again, the, the setup is throwing me off just a little bit. Hopefully the picture is better. So we set up a new camera yesterday. We used it for the first time last night. People commented that they could tell a difference. And you know what? You should be able to tell more of a difference tonight because somebody informed me, my tech guy, thank you so much, Marty McPadden, that uh, even though the picture looked slightly better, I would not have been happy with just slightly better based on the investment in the camera, but we needed to switch the StreamYard application to 1080p. So we should be operating at 1080p now. So all is, all is well, all is good now. All right. So Nebraska live tomorrow night at eight Eastern. I'm working on a Texas A&M roster breakdown, the offense and the defense, and we'll get some more teams to you. Uh, people have commented that they won all time program rankings. Don't know if I'm going to get to that by the start of the season. Media day starts later this week. We'll be covering media days from the Big 12 this week. Next week are the rest of the four major conferences along with the American Conference. Next week, actually the Pac-12, I believe, is the following week. But um, media days are coming. So we will be at it every minute. Good to see you, Nate. We were talking about Notre Dame, Nate. We had our fill of Notre Dame. We're good with Notre Dame. We, we, we cover Notre Dame football top to bottom. We're good with Notre Dame. And uh, Cheryl is letting me know that the streaming is... So I like that. And I've just reconsidered here the last few days that typically I unveil my predictions for the season the night before kickoff. That's really not good for views, even though that's when I want to do it because I want as much information as I can get. I want to see August camp and see what happens. And then I want to unveil my predictions at the last minute. Once everybody starts playing, nobody cares about summer predictions. So I guess I'm going to get those out as soon as possible. Guess I'm going to work on the 2021 predictions. MSU number one fan. We haven't seen you for a long time. Good to see you. Notre Dame doesn't belong in the playoffs. We would expect no less from a Spartan. Also, a lot of other things to work on. So we will call it a night here. I appreciate you being here, of course. 
Nebraska on Tuesday, Ohio State and Florida State on Wednesday, and another call-in show coming up on Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern time. We've got our Miami doubleheader on Thursday, Oklahoma on Friday. And, of course, again, I will be here throughout the week to take your comments and your questions, your calls uh, throughout the week. But let's um, get to it on this content. Uh, so be looking out for some uh some uh, roster breakdowns, analysis, predictions, schedule previews, all of the more coming up very soon. So you guys have a great night, and we will see you for Nebraska Live at 8 Eastern.